County Schools Board of Education. Uh, this time we ask that you please place all electronic communication devices on silent or vibrate. Now it is time for the adoption of the agenda. What is the pleasure of this body? It has been properly motioned and second to adopt the agenda. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Approve 5-0. So Holmes and Doss. All right. Now, presentations and discussion. Archway discussion, Mr. Will Doss and Brittany Standifer. Standifer to begin the process and uh, I'll be here to support and answer any additional questions and give some additional information since our last meeting. Yeah, I just turned it on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's so great to be here today. Thank you all so much for the time to um, discuss Archway Partnership, to give you a little bit of an update about where we've been over the past year, um, where we are right now, and where we're looking to go um, in, the, in the next year. It's a very fancy podium. Um, I think it's important to start with Archway Partnerships. Why? Why are we here in the community? Why do we do what we do? Um, this mission statement really drives it home. We are about connecting communities with higher education resources to address locally identified community and economic development issues. Um, really want to stress the locally identified piece. We are here in the community to do what you ask us to do, to learn about priorities that the community has on its forefront, um, to be an extra resource to help you move towards your goals. Archway Partnership, um, it's a special engagement. We're only in eight communities across the state, and Spalding County has been with us now since 2015. I think um, Will has shared this with you all, our one pager for the year that kind of gives you our year in review. Um, your investment in Archway par Partnership has seen a return of over $270,000. Um, that's work across 21 projects, um, across three different priority areas that the community has set. Um, that's seeing at least 30 students in the community over the course of the year, um, 11 expert faculty in the community as well. And this is just kind of a highlight of some of the projects that we have here, but I'm here today to talk specifically about some of the engagement and the impact that we've had for the school district. Um, I think first and foremost, you know, Griffin Spalding, the Archway Partnership was built about, or built here for intergovernmental collaboration. That's kind of how it all started. And so we've kept that true to our mission here um, with our 3G platform, which is an opportunity for our city, our county, and our school district to get together monthly, um, sometimes more often, depending on what's going on. Um, and it's been really special to see over the last two years um, that I've been here in Spalding County because we've had new leadership from the city, the county, and the school district. And so as much as we are about doing projects, we're also about creating a collaborative table and an opportunity for community stakeholders to come together um, to learn about what's happening and how we can share resources and support one another. And so when there's a major disaster or there's an emergency in the community, a need, a helping hand that you need, our, our school superintendent, our city administrator, and our county manager are on a text thread with one another. And so we're really proud of the opportunity to just convene those partners. We've also expanded that to our communications teams from the city, the county, and the school district, giving them a platform to come together. They're all sharing messages with similar stakeholders, but how can we stretch that message across the community um, to answer questions about what's happening in our school district or our city or our county? I think one of the best things that came of this this year is during the education celebration at the start of the year, you saw the city, the county, and the school district. Um, we had incentives, we had the raffle. That came from one of those communications meetings of asking Adam, hey, what do you need from us as you kick off the school year? And the city and the county answering that call. We've got some other projects here. Um, some walkabil a walkability study done by the School of Engineering um, at Future World. Future World Road, excuse me, um, Elementary in Spalding High School, an outdoor classroom design guide book that was designed for administrators so that they can think about flexible spaces for the classroom and know what to ask um, when they are looking at building those out. We had a mental health summit this year, or excuse me, last summer, 
And that was all about learning, you know, what resources are here in the community and what are needed to address one of, I think, community-wide an issue is um, the support of mental health issues. We continue to support the Griffin Spalding Ministerial Alliance, um, the convening of our local leaders, um, our local preachers, and you know this is what an example of you know adopt a school and the mentoring program are by far a school district initiative, but a way that Archway supports is the convening of those stakeholders, um, and those ministers have taken up the charge to adopt schools um, to support them in ways that are needed, as well as supporting the mentoring. So in this, the fall of 2021, we all went down to Macon together um, in order to look at a community school project. Um, that has been an initiative that the Archway Partnership has been looking to support over the past couple of years. Um, by no means is it an Archway project. The community schools, we understand that this is a school district-wide initiative. Um, but looking to see how can the University of Georgia and the resources that are on campus be, be plugged in into this community in order to help you all achieve your goals. I think that's one of the things I want to stress today is just that um, Archway is meant to be a resource to help you move towards your priority areas and your goals. It's not meant to be extra projects that Brittany comes up with and is excited about. It's about listening to you all, looking at your strategic plans, looking at strategic plans that we've um, built together, and how can we connect the resources that'll help you go far. And so, um, kind of from this collaborative space, we've seen the city and the county step up financially to commit, um, you know, what do you all need as a school district in order to implement that this? And looking at how they can line item that in their budget. Um, I think the archway table, the collaboration there has allowed for this to happen. Um, we have researched opportunities for the community needs assessment. I think we've talked a lot, Dr. Simmons, Will and I, about what the first step in a community school would be. and we. All, all have kind of seen that a community needs assessment would be a first step to make sure that we're, we've got a design before we start building the ship. And so we worked with the Carl Vincent Institute of Government um, to have a proposal of what an assessment, the surveying could look like, the focus groups could look like. And to be quite frank, it's got a large price tag. And so we on the Archway side feel like we have done our due diligence to look at the University of Georgia to see what resources are available, present that as an option, and now it's kind of in the hands of the executive committee to see if that's where they would like to move forward or if there's an opportunity elsewhere that would be more feasible for the community at wide. We've also identified partners in support of needed interventions that um, would come down the line. So we see the first step being a needs assessment, hiring the staff, and then obviously creating interventions that meet the needs of the needs assessment. And so we've got willing partners at the College of Education and the School of Social Work ready to go. Um, we've had lots of conversations about what those things could look like, but um, again, don't want to start sailing the ship before it's built. And so just kind of in a holding period of, to see how the Archway Executive Committee can support the build out of a community school. Um, some other pieces that I've just been engaged in and have been really fun, um, the exemplary board certification, pearls, pumps, and books, the education celebration, day one in the district. Um, I think day one in the district is another good example of the community coming together, of having the platform to say, hey city, um, who can you send over to our elementary schools, to our high schools to um, support the first our, our students coming back into the classroom? And so um, Will and I, had a discussion about short-term and long-term goals um, for Archway Partnership in Spalding County. And for those of you who don't know, I have transition roles. I'm no longer the Archway professional here in the community. And so right now, we are at um, a transition point. And I think it's a fun time because you all have been working with Archway for eight years now. And so I think it's a good time to, to shake things up, to look at priority areas. And so um, the Archway professional role is currently posted. We're looking for a new Archway professional to be based here um, full time every day. Um, also Chuck and Stephanie, Chuck Copeland and Stephanie Windham have served as the Archway chairs since the beginning. Um, and they have been so amazing and moved this community forward um, by, by, by great leaps and bounds. Um, but they have decided to step down and make room for the next um, group of leaders to lead the Archway Partnership. Um, 
Will and Carmen Caldwell have been asked to serve as interim chairs as we think about um, what the next rendition of our trade partnership looks like. Um, and also in this, we are evaluating the executive committee. Um, I have to stress again, Archway is about a locally driven process. And so we have to have engage executive committee members that can come to our team or come to the Archway professional, come to the meeting and say, hey, we're seeing XYZ as an issue. We'd really like to plug in some resources here. What do you have to offer? And so um, we just want to make sure that all that are engaged with the executive committee are um, engaged stakeholders that are looking for resources and looking for supports that matches their goals and their priorities. Um, we're also thinking about our priorities. Can I interrupt real quick right there? Just yes. Because one of the points that you were making is about the new archway professional. And so one of the concerns of the executive committee is that that person, not that Brittany has not done a tremendous job while living in Athens, uh, but it's difficult to, you know, she has learned the community very quickly and very well, uh, but having a local person. And so I know that there are, my understanding, Ms. Angel has said that there's at least four applicants that are strong candidates that are either local or willing to move to be local, uh, which I think is, is a, a testament to the work and things that are being done. So I was excited to hear that. I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, for sure. That is definitely a priority. And I think, you know, the re-engagement of our Archway chairs are going to be really integral to the success of that Archway professional. Um, and that's something that the executive committee is looking at right now. So this past month, we had Archway professional from across the state um, come and talk about, you know, what does their model look like? What is the relationship of the Archway professional and the executive committee look like? You know, in some communities, the Archway professional, every Monday morning, they meet with the chair and they have a conversation about what's on the docket for the week and what's going on in the community to hear about what's happening. And so just kind of looking at what those relationships will look like um, in the future is what the executive committee is focused on now. Um, and then also looking at the priority areas. So for the past year, um, the Archway Executive Committee kind of narrowed the focus around community collaboration, um, excuse me, intergovernmental collaboration, mental health advocacy, and then the support of the community schools. Um, and that's really narrowed the focus. And we're starting to talk about the, the Griffin Now Plan that we produced. Um, for the most part in the, the spring of 2021 and the fall of 2020. Um, and those five priority areas that were identified um, by your board, by the city, by the county, and then affirmed through community surveys, and then the engagement of about 50 stakeholders to create that plan. So how can we utilize resources from the Archway Partnership to accomplish those goals? Um, this past year, that wasn't we had a system where each one of the priority areas had a leader who was then intended to um, kind of lead that charge, but we're looking at if that model works. But again, just kind of reevaluating what the focus of the group is. Um, but it's just important, the executive committee, they direct the work plan. It's not the archway professional. Um, that executive committee is the archway partnership. And then long term, um, just what does it look like to align the work of the Archway Partnership with the Griffin Now Plan and then also the school district strategic plan? Um, Archway Partnership is not meant to be an extra project or something extra to do. It's about building your toolbox to meet the goals that you've already set out. And so um, I was looking at the school district plan and thinking about, you know, what does that look like um, to implement the district literacy plan? Um, it talks a lot about research. We've got world-class faculty and students that are um, always willing to do research, evaluation, um, and things of that nature. Talking about addressing the diverse needs of students, um, how can you tap into UGA in order to accomplish that goal? And then I have one that really stuck out to me was attracting quality candidates. I know we talk a lot about um, workforce retention, having high quality teachers, having them be here in the community. Um, we've got the College of Education. What would it look like to work with students there to say, hey, what would be attractive to you um, and, or as you're making your plans for your career, what would it take to bring you to Griffin Spalding? 
And so I've got some examples from some other communities about what it looks like for a school district to really engage with the Archway Partnership. So I'm happy to share those, but I'll just pause really quick to see if um, there are any questions and ask Will if I answered all the things that you asked me to answer. Or Mr. Ha Mr. Brown. Go ahead, Ms. McDonough, you're recognized. Thank you. Hey, Brittany, it's great seeing you. You too. Um, uh, back to uh, slide number five, researched opportunities for the community needs assessment. So the needs assessment has not been completed yet. Is that what I hear? That's correct. And if we get the Carl Vinson Institute on board, what, you said it would be really expensive. How expensive? Um, it was upwards of six figures. So I'm not, we didn't have a concrete number because there was also questions about what that would look like going through an RFP process and um, what were other options and we're kind of tied to just kind of providing that as an option and happy to you know be in a competitive process but that's kind of what they presented because anyone that the University of Georgia to, to me as a grad of Georgia <laughs> the Carl Vincent Institute is world renowned and well known so my last question would be the identified the partners in support of needed interventions who are those partners yeah so those partners were faculty members that we spoke to in each one of those colleges that have expertise in um, the two areas and so just you know we've talked about in a community school and addressing needs that are outside of the classroom so if we're talking about food insecurity if we're talking about um, preparedness into the classroom how can those faculty members kind of help design their research and their um, their deliverables around the needs of this community okay thank you thank you mr. Brown uh, if I don't can, can I say? yes mr. Doss you recognize thank you so much um, I think one of the things that I didn't realize even over this eight years is that most of the other communities are whether it's individually so we have three funding partners uh, the county, the city, the, the school, individually we could be utilizing the students or the resources there on the UGA campus more than what we actually are. So whether it's projects that we want to see done on a particular school site, whether it's something we want to see here, we could be tapping into some of those things and we're not. Many of those other communities are. The city, I, th I mean, the county, I think, has done a, probably a little bit more than we have by getting some surveys done of some intersections and things like that. I think the only thing that we've really done is that school outdoor classroom work and, and the walkability. And so, you know, as a board, we could come up with many more things that we could have to pay for if we didn't have Archway with us. Yeah, and if I could make a suggestion on that too, I would look at your strategic plan and things that are kind of falling to the to-do list, you're thinking how are we going to get this done, and think about flexible ways you could potentially use the University of Georgia um, to kind of meet those needs and think creatively around those pieces. I also think as the priority areas are revisit, I could see, um, you know, an issue work group around education or youth development, and that would be a committee of community members that could also uplift the priority areas of the, the strategic plan. So I just hope that you would all think of it as an extra resource in your toolbox to get the things done that you're looking to accomplish. Okay, anything? Mm, I'll wait. Okay. Well, I, I want to revisit my comments that I made, let's see, October 20th, uh, 2020, as it related to Archway and a couple other things that the Board of Education or school district enter agreements and we serve as partners through many different things, whether if it's GSBA, strategic plan, archway. And one of the main comments that I spoke about, it says, some students require more support and wraparound services that others do not, and additional needs that some scholars have does not take anything away from students who don't need those services. With that in mind, I would like to stress the importance of making sure that we have partnerships that should complement our efforts 
in what we're doing in our school district. What happens on the north side of town needs to happen on all sides of town. We have made some strides in the right direction. I would like to offer the following suggestions how Archway could use their resources to further support what we're doing here in our district. I do want to say to Brittany, to Ms. Standifer and her team, thank you so much for the partnerships that you have done. In 2020, when I brought this to your attention, uh, and Mr. Dawson's attention when he was chair, you were one of the first ones to say, Centel, what can we do to make this partnership better? And so I want to publicly say thank you to you for supporting the Board of Education in many different areas, which you listed in your PowerPoint presentation. But I do want to make sure that this is a conversation that our board can continue to have because there were many members of this body that had questions as it relates to the substance and what Archway is doing uh, for our community. And so hearing your presentation and in our email thread, I wanna make sure that were your questions answered, Ms. McDonald? Yes, yes. Okay. Leader Holmes, were your questions answered or concerns that you had? If. No, like seriously, we're, we're, this is a... I respect Brittany and, and uh, this, I, I don't want to publicly air my displeasure about Archway. Uh, I, I, made, I make it no secret that, you know, I, I just haven't bought into it because I was one of the original ones at the first meeting we ever ever had, and I don't think we stayed the course on what was laid out uh, as to what we could do to improve our community. So with that said, I, I don't wanna bash or discredit anything that she has done because I, I respect her that much. So I, I reserve to keep my comments about anything that I'm not pleased with. I, 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 just, I just keep them to myself. Thank you so much. Well, in an effort to make sure that we are all on the same page and that we're moving in the same direction, uh, Leader Holmes, I will be asking you uh, from that first meeting that you had and you know, getting a more comprehensive outlook on how you feel so that we can move in the right direction and it can be something that every member of this body is proud to support. And so I'm asking you as my leader uh, one of, as one of the longest serving member of this body that we have the conversation so that we can provide guidance to Archway so that it can be the partnership that Griffin Spalding County Schools want it to be with the guidance, with the input, and the thoughtfulness of each member sitting up here today. I want to make it clear it is, you know, my main priority is the school system. But um, it, it should be a community effort moving forward as far as our community, doing things that will improve our community. And I just don't feel like that, that has been done. I don't think the relationships are, are genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's a big part of, of, you know, a collaboration like this, relationships. Yes, sir. Your relationships. I'm a relationship person, and I just don't don't see the relationships. We've seen recent events that has occurred that shows the relationships are haven't been built. And uh, I, but but you know I'm a part of this board and whatever this board so desires, uh, I'm going to be a team player. I always have been. Thank you so much. As you see, the gentleman from the third has much passion for which he speaks, and we are going to respect that. But we will move forward as a board to determine what the best needs are and how we will move forward from input from every member of this body. So thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments uh, as it relates to I had a few things. I didn't know this Wait, hold on one enough. second, Mr. Doss. Go ahead, Ms. Cook. Mr. Chair, I'd like to request quarterly updates from Archway to the board. Okay. She would like, Mrs. Cook would like quarterly updates from Archway quarterly to the board. Quarterly updates. Okay. Quarterly. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. All right. Mr. Doss? Um, I, I just think we're in a great spot to see some of those changes that 
Mr. Holmes is wanting to see. Um, I think the, obviously, working at relationships, everyone has to be willing and wanting, and I'm hoping that that will continue. We, we shall see. Uh, but with new leadership, with, new, with the ability to have new direction of what the priorities are going to be and the focus is going to be, uh, I'll be real honest, the, the new professional that comes in, the archway professional, is, is a key component to that because that person has to mesh with, with everybody. And so uh, assuming that, that that is able to be done, um, I think I'm, I'm excited for the progress that we can continue to make. And before we close out this discussion, I do want to go back to my comments on October 20th of 2020. And there were two specific questions that I asked, and I would like to say thank you for getting them answered and uh, the, having an ocular demonstration of the support that Archway has provided. One was, is, are there any tangible evidence or data that supports how Archway partnership has benefited the district and the community? And then the last one was, how will this partnership of Archway moving forward yield positive results for the district and specifically District 1? And like I said, you and I have had this conversation and to be able to, two years later, three years later, to see those tangible things, um, I'm excited that we were able to have this conversation to be able to move forward and looking forward to having more conversations, courageous conversations, so that every member of this body can support this that happens in the community. To Mr. Holmes's point, Leader Holmes's point, when he talked about things that happen in the community. And so it may not just be in, yes, we're the educational arm of the community, but there are other things that, that happen. So when we have senseless shootings in our community, when we have you know, people that are hungry, and all these other things that are happening, we're looking for Archway to be that support and to be that resource. And so, we're, like I said, we're going to continue this conversation. And I just want to thank Ms. McDonald. I want to thank Dr. Simmons, Dean Cook, Vice Chairman Doss, and Leader Holmes for their input in this discussion as we move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to continuing the conversation. Oh, one last question. Uh, do you mind uh, staying on our exemplar committee for... GSBA? I do not mind. Thank you so much. That. Thank you. All right. Next item, we have Mrs. Judy Battle, Workers' Compensation Insurance Coverage Updates. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members, and Superintendent Simmons. I bring to you this, this evening information regarding our workers' compensation insurance for the Griffins Baldwin County School District. Thank you. All right, so of course, we start with our non negotiables. Um, we are going to exercise pace, we'll be professional, accountable, and communicate effectively. And we know what our focus areas are, literacy, enrollment, attendance, discipline, and solving. Our mission, distinctive brand, strong leaders, and great schools. And our mission is to empower each student to graduate college and career ready. Our roadmap to success, we focus on our pillars of leadership, teaching, and learning. And this update that I'm going to provide to you this evening focuses primarily on organizational and operational efficiency, as well as high-performing staff. I want to give you some background on how we arrived here. We started uh, last fall doing some research about workers' comp coverage. We wanted to compare fully insured, against self-insured, and so we conducted some research to figure out what might be a good solution for our school district. And I wanna explain to you the differences. Right now, we are self-insured, 
and what a self-insured workers' comp plan looks like, we cover injuries dollar for dollar. Um, any kind of treatment plan, any medical equipment, any settlement, lost wages, we pay it dollar for dollar, which is slightly different from what most people are accustomed to when we think about insurance. Uh, what a fully, insurant, fully insured policy will provide is what we call a deductible. It's very similar to what we consider when we think about our homeowners or our car insurance. So fully insured will give us less risk. Um, we have a deductible. Once that deductible amount is satisfied, then the insurance company begins to continuously pay those claims. Um, also, the administrative costs associated with being fully insured, that's worked into our premium, as well as it works well for smaller employers. Um, we are a large employer in our community, however, we want to look at minimizing the risk and exposure when it comes to work-related injury. I wanted to just kind of give you an idea of what a cost would look like in terms of fully insured or self-insured. For our claims with workers' comp, we could be liable for up to $450,000 per claim. And this is operating as a self-insured plan. And that's per claim. Right now, we have liability at 194 claims. And that includes our current active claims as well as claims when we do a look back to see what we might be liable for. Also, we have local administrative costs. And when I think about that, I think about the time that we put into operating those claims. Right now, each school has a part when someone is hurt at the school. That information is filtered through HR. We work through a third party administrator. And then we, we're managing a claim. Um, by looking at a fully insured plan, we will have the benefit of a trained medical professional, right? Someone that knows injuries. They know about physical therapy, um, recovery time, light duty options. So that's another benefit for going fully insured. Right now, we use a paper routing system. If someone is hurt, they still fill out that paperwork. It flows through HR. We work with third party administrators. Using fully insured this plan, we will have access to an online portal we'll be able to report claims quickly, more efficiently, and minimize the pass-through of paper. We also have post-accident training. Sometimes when people are, um, have an accident and need additional training, we facilitate that training. Using a fully insured policy, which we're gonna present, we have access to a multitude of training vid videos and modules, including the vector system that will be available to our employees as well as in-person training sessions. More of a preventative measure as opposed, as opposed to a post-accident measure. We also have correspondence between the third-party administrative physicians and employees. Fully insured will help us coordinate that um, communication. We'll have employees now trying, when is my appointment? When is physical therapy? I need this MRI. We will have a medically trained professional coordinating those appointments for our employees. Also, right now, we deal with the, um, the monthly bill of reconciliation. That also impacts finance because we're looking at those claims. We're writing checks, trying to get those bills paid. So those things don't potentially wind up going to collection or impacting our employees. Also, scheduling appointments, again, we'll have trained professionals in the field of medicine. And then panel review, this is very important for liability purposes. Panel review makes sure that our physicians are currently active and still engaged with our workers' comp program, and we can get that through a fully insured policy. And then overall general claims management. We also have a reinsurance policy that's set at $60,000, as well as the third-party administrative fees of $25,000. So I wanted to share with you the process. I did bring this for in front of you last month uh, for informational purposes to let you know where we were in the process. We wrote an RFP, we put it out for bid, we had response come in, and then after the response came in, we did an initial scoring rubric, invited that bidder to come in and actually do an in-person presentation. We followed that up with the second scoring rubric, and we were well pleased. And based on the outcome, uh, the recommendation to award the RFP for fully insured workers' compensation will be brought forward to you at this evening's board meeting at 6 p.m. So, 
Board members, we have heard the report or the update on workers' compensation from Mrs. Battle. Are there any questions, comments, concerns at this time? We'll start with the good reverend and then go to Leader Holmes. Yes, Ms. Battle, I, I have a uh, We'll start with the good reverend. The good, oh, I thought We'll start with the good, good reverend good, Doss good from the sacred now. second and then Leader Holmes of the third and then Ms. <laughs> McDonald of the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Good Reverend. <laughs> Do you have any samples of previous years being self-insured, um, the amounts that were paid versus what going with fully insured amounts that would be paid? I realize that when you're self, that you are subject to whatever it might, could and would be. Um, but do you have any of, of that kind of information? We, I have the number of claims, um, and typically we budget right at $300,000. Um, the year of 2021 was kind of off because we had the pandemic and we didn't have in-person, you know, people working. But I could give you numbers um, right. and then we can take it from there. Uh, so we had 121 claims during the 21-22 school year. Right now, we're up to 73 claims for 22-23, and mean, we're in uh, 73 claims for this current school year. Um, and we are close, getting to the place where we're closing out the school year, where we start to see some of those uh, reckless injuries, you know, people moving furniture, doing things that uh, could create to unnecessary injury. So right now, we're on track to pretty much in right at the same rate as we were last year, over 100 injuries. Um, we can get dollar figures for you, but those numbers give you an idea of what our injuries look like annually. Okay. And I would be interested in that, just okay. to know, you know, because I realize that each injury has a different dollar amount and there's no way to specifically get those, but there has to be some type of average that we're working off of so that we can see if we're hitting this number on a regular basis, it's going to cost this, the fully insured is going to cost this, um, so that we can make that educated decision. Okay. And may I? Yes. Thank you so much. I'm just going to get 30 seconds of your time. Thank you, sir. So Mrs. Battle, as a, he's yielding me 30 seconds of his time. So with the 73 claims that we have right now, uh, do you know what the dollar amount is for those claims? So they vary. So with their, they're still open. Um, we can get you the total. Uh, so we can get that in, included with what the claims cost us last year. And so the last question, at 73 claims right now, you think that we will hit somewhere around 121 by the end of the school year? We hope not. Well, right. We hope not. So I would I, hope not. <laughs> but So what has been, the, like, in years... From, so we're looking at 2023, so let's go to 2022, 2021 with okay. those numbers. So if we look at 2021, we had 69, but you know, that was the pandemic time. Mm -hmm. So we sent people home. So we didn't have nearly as many. Then we hit um, 121 the following year, everyone came back, we started having those entries. And now we're a little more, uh, we're closer to the end of the year, maybe three quarters of the way done, we're at 73. Okay. So those are the numbers. Right, um, and they're still coming in almost every day though. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Leader Holmes. Sure. I'm, I'm positive. <laughs> I was very clear when I said the good reverend and then Leader Holmes. <laughs> uh, Ms. Battle, I, I, I'm not familiar. If you could give me just a brief synopsis of uh, the reinsurance policy. Okay, and if, if I may, Mr. Jones has those numbers. If you would allow him to come to the mic and we can get that. Are y'all okay with that? Sure. Yes. Awesome. I'll answer your question first. The reinsurance policy is what pays all claims if they get to 450000 once they exceed that, that insurance takes over, and that costs us about 60000 a year. And I think Ms. Battle was trying to 
articulate that. Maybe in a, a prior slide, you've got that cost. You've also got to pay the cost of the, the TPA, which manages the claim, which is about 25000 so that's 85000 in cost. The indirect cost is the labor of finance, HR personnel, school personnel managing, which hard to track that, but there's a dollar impact for that. Then we have a checking account that we have to keep open. We have to buy check stock, weekly check runs back and forth. 52 times a year, There's a lot of that that builds up. So the reinsurance is about 60,000, it's been bid out. I normally bring that in here in May timeframe and approve that for the following year for the board since it was over 25,000. That's normally what it runs. Uh, on, on the, where we, how we were doing it, what, what type of, uh, I guess, budget in dollars <coughs> were, were you placing money into to cover Right. So, so in our presentation here that I'm about to do, oh, okay. it's no, it'll show that 300,000 is normally what we budget for workers' comp claims, round about 300,000. Okay. And we hope to save on that by going to a fully insured plan, which she'll share with you in the board recommendation, it will be less than that, okay. plus minimize our risk, plus they'll take over the old claims that we won't still have to pay on a recurring okay. basis. Okay. One, one last question. With with uh, these services uh, for workman comp, which I'm, I'm I'm real familiar with, working for a medical uh, institution, it's easily for a medical institution to absorb all of these. So, and I'm saying I'm getting to the point of everything was local in house. Okay. So so when we do fully insured. Are we going to have like local partnership with the hospital or doctors or whatever to keep it right here in Griffin Spalding County versus sending uh, employees and staff, you know, all over the sure. all over the state? And, and that's an excellent question. So with that, even going fully insured, we have control over the panel of physicians. So we will continue to use local primary care physicians as well as the emergency room. Um, those practices will stay the same. So we won't send people out unless it's a very specific injury type mm -hmm. where they have to see a specialist. Um, but we do want to keep the money, um, the transactions locally, and it helps the employees, right? So they're right. not driving all over Georgia. Right, right. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So let me let me answer. Go back to the oh, original go ahead, question, Mr. right? Jones, quick. So I've got go. five years of data. Let me just run through these years, and this is what we had to provide to our prospective bidders. These costs I'm fixing to tell you are incurred costs, which is a combination of physical dollars paid, which, and then at the time, what we think the claim is still owed. On top of what I'm going to tell you, you got to add that sixty thousand, that twenty-five thousand, and that hundred forty thousand. So the number is going to sound low. 2017, 2018, 180,000. I'm just rounding down to the nearest dollar. Uh, 630 of 2019, 170,000. 630 of 20, 201,000. 630 of 2021, 172,000. 630 of 2022, 158,000. And so far this year, this has got some settlements in it. We're 353,000 this year. So we've got some claims that are already triggered to go towards that $450,000 max. So with, with, with this year being so high work with some of those settlement from those previous years? Could be, yeah, when it's paid. Okay. All right. Does that answer, does that help? Okay. It does, thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, yeah, sorry, Ms. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Brown. No problem. Ms. Battle, I was just curious as to what the, for the fully insured coverage, what is the deductible? It's $100,000. Okay. And then the firm that um, put in the RFP, is, is that a local firm? It's actually the Georgia School Board Association. Oh, is it? Okay. I must have missed that somewhere along the line. Yeah. Okay. It's in the Here next, it it's, it's, it's in a memo for, um, for the action memo. I think I do remember reading that. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, so I've heard Hold that. On. Wait, a couple, one I'm second. sorry, Ms. One, Brown. Wait, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, 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 Ms. McDonough, uh, were you, you're good? Yes, and to me, GSBA is instant credibility, so. Okay, okay great. Yeah. Leader Holmes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> you go get together one day. 
So I've heard that in a couple of key conversations, GSBA. So that, that tells me that we haven't been taking advantage of resources that has been available to us for years since we have been a part of GSBA. Am I am correct in assuming that? The gentleman has much passion for which he speaks. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to yield my answer to Mr. Dawes. I, I just really think that by exploring, right, additional benefits, things to enhance our current services, we're recognizing opportunities to do things more efficiently. Okay. All right, so if there are no other questions, comments, concerns, thank you so much, Mrs. Battle. Next up, we have the Director of Federal Programs, Ms. Barbara Austin, Summer Learning Updates. Summer Lit Camp. <laughs> Good afternoon. Reading is lit. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Brown, our so esteemed funny. board members, and our own Superintendent Simmons. Um, it is our pleasure this time to come before you just to share our plans for this year's extended summer, summer learning opportunity during the summer. Um, our, my colleague has already shared our non-negotiables, whereas we will set the pace by being professional, accountable, and communicating effectively in our foci areas of literacy, enrollment, attendance, and discipline. Here in Griffin Spalding, we will have a distinctive brand, strong leaders, and great schools where we empower each student to graduate college and career ready. Our continual work throughout the summer will certainly support um, our increased student achievement from our strategic map. And so before you, you'll see some important dates regarding our summer program. It will operate during the time frame of June 5th through June 29th, and we will have a four-day session for both our elementary and middle school levels this year. Um, also, you'll see that we will um, offer some field trips. We're excited about the enrichment opportunities. Oh, thank you, Lenny. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Lenny. Okay. So I'll, I'll start over just a little bit. Our operational schedule will be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this summer, June 5th through June 29th. We are looking forward to offering some enrichment opportunities of field trips for our students this year. And our times will be the same as last year where our kids will be with us from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. during the four days at both the elementary and middle school levels. We will be offering services to kindergarten through eighth grade scholars this summer. And we're excited about our summer sites again this year. You will see that we have four elementary sites and two middle school sites. We look forward to serving the capacity of 950 students this year um, across those sites. All schools will be involved from those areas. Um, our scholars are looking forward uh, because they've received communication already of being a part of Lit Camp this summer where they will have the opportunity to have some engaging um, curriculum, enrichment opportunities, as well as social emotional learning with our students. Okay. And we plan to have small classrooms or small um, offerings to our students. As you'll see, it'll be a 15 to one teacher to student ratio max. Um, we're, and the teachers are excited. We've had a lot of feedback and um, interest from our, from our teachers as well. All teaching slots have been applied for and then some, so we're excited this year about that. Uh, the team has really worked hard this year to get started early, get the word out early to parents, to students, and to staffing. And so this is just a quick overview of our daily schedule. Um, you'll see that we are um, planning to serve the whole child from um, rigorous academics to social emotional learning um, to making sure that they have enrichment opportunities. And it's been a collaborative effort across our teams where students will receive two nutritious meals every day and will have free transportation from our district level as well. Okay. And we certainly want to see the growth of our kids, so there will be a pre and post assessment of their growth throughout the summer. All right, just a very quick outlook of our budget and curriculum. As you'll see up in the corner there, it has Scholastic Lit Camp. We are using the curriculum from Scholastic this year. Very excited about that opportunity. You'll hear more about that this afternoon at 6 from me as well. I'll be back before you again. Um, the curriculum is very structured. It's very... Um, 
put together well for the kids and we really feel like it'll be an engaging and interactive opportunity um, around the theme of Lit Camp and it is literature camp for our students and so we're just excited they will get both um, English and reading and also math um, there this summer and like I said before social emotional learning and enrichment opportunities and I think everybody's also excited about Lego education this year. Kids will get an opportunity to really explore some problem solving skills throughout the summer um, and to see their work come to live, um, come alive before them. All right. So this is just a timeline this summer. Um, for this summer, we've already mailed several communications to our parents' homes. The schools have been working very diligently as well to send communication home with our students. And so we're already about to go into our fifth round of communication um, to parents as well. So we've been excited about that. We do have a registration form that is live for parents. Um, and when we checked yesterday morning, we were already at triple numbers of parents that have already responded over spring break uh, that they want their kids to be able to attend this summer. So so we're excited about those numbers really crawling up to that max. Okay. And again, we do plan to offer um, a number of field trips, particularly on Fridays and enrichment opportunities throughout the schedule as well this summer. So that would be an exciting time for our kids as well. And of course, with having a new curriculum, through using Lit Camp with Scholastic. There will be professional learning and training for all of the teachers who will be participating this summer, and that will be happening in May, so we're looking for forward to that as well. And this last slide just kind of gives an overview of project planning this year. The team has come together on a number of occasions just to make sure this is a successful year for our students and that we've crossed all the T's and dotted I's. Are there any questions for me at this time? <clears throat> Members of the body, we have heard an update on summer school, a.k.a. summer lit camp update from Ms. Austin. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? Um, I know that Ms. McDonald and I, when I got up when you were presenting, I was conferring with her because last year we know that there were some challenges. Mm -hmm. And so to see that the list of things that we were able to remember transportation, communication to parents, empty classrooms. Uh, it's good to see that you have addressed those things in your presentation. It's good to see that parents, parentals have been notified and that even during spring break that they were uh, registering and uh, school was on their mind. The only thing that I, and I may, I just think it should happen but I don't necessarily need to happen, um, it is professional learning and training. Being that some of the student scholars that are attending summer school probably uh, participate in PBIS, right? Say that one more time. So some me. of the scholars that participate in the summer lit camp mm -hmm. are students that have benefited from PBIS during the school year. Yes, sir. Okay, so that's true. Is there any way that we can incorporate within the training PBIS so that you know they can continue to be rewarded for their good behavior. Okay. We'll certainly make note of that to be a part of the SEL component as well. Okay. Um, and I'm sure that we could figure out a way to ensure that we're able to do so. Um, it's the, the Lit Camp concept with Scholastic has a very robust SEL component that has several different areas that it focuses on, like courage and hope, teamwork, perfect, those items as well that we could collaborate together. Okay. And I'm sure, Dr. McElroy, you're just excited that there's something else for you to do, right? <laughs> She's part of that team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, um, any other members having? Ms. McDonald? Ms. Austin, it's good to see you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this. Uh, I just remember that last summer wasn't what it should have been, mm -hmm. um, in, in my view, for the, for the things that Mr. Brown mentioned. Is a teacher available excuse me is a teacher does a teacher have the opportunity to include someone that needs this kind of instruction that perhaps hasn't gone to the website and you know signed up or so, so if joe cool's parents haven't signed him or her up mm -hmm. how does joe cool get in my classroom in the summer okay that, and he or she really needs it so we have this is an extension 
of services from the regular school year. Sure. We want to make sure we continually meet the needs of those students that have the uh, that are our most at risk students when it comes to academic needs. Um, this will be an extension of MTSS within our school as well. So those kids have been identified um, as a priority level of students that we want to make sure we close the, any learning loss gaps there and continue that work going forward. And so we are adding to that list um, as need be when we have slots available from the kids that have been identified because we really want to focus in on making sure that, that that learning continues for those students. And the teachers are aware of who the kids have been identified based on the work that our MTSS department is doing within the schools. Um, so when you say how do they know if it's just a child that's not on that list? Um, right now, if that child is not on that list, we're focusing on those kids that have the most need this summer to continue learning from the MTSS process. Does that make sense a little bit? It does. Would would academic success have a, a part of that role also? I mean, how the how he or she does on MAP? Yes, ma'am. That is one criteria. Mm -hmm that the students would be there. We have a criteria listing because, as you'll see this afternoon, that the funding for the program is to make sure that those kids that uh, are served in what we call the rank order, as you know with federal programs, you've heard that before. Um, so we wanna make sure from an equitable standpoint that the students with the most at-risk needs based on that criteria, whether this map is um, low scores on um, reading, math, behavior attendance, there are a number of criteria mm -hmm. that we look at to rank order students that have that need. And MAP is one of those criteria. Yeah, I think the thing that disturbed me the most last year was that um, class, some of the classrooms only had three or four students in mm -hmm. it. And um, I hope that doesn't happen again this year. We're working diligently to make right. sure that we're communicating to the parents. Like this week, we're on the phone calling again. Uh, we're reaching out to the schools. Um, the team is also making sure that the schools know, okay, these are kids we've heard from. These are kids that are registered, and these are the ones that have not, particularly students that are on that list. Help us to make sure that we reach those families as well. Mm -hmm. And I think another great thing is that we're getting transportation right. out to our families early enough for them to be able to participate. Right. That was an issue uh, last year for some families that they just couldn't get the students there because of a number of reasons. Sure. If that makes sure. sense. Appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Brown. No problem at all. Leader Holmes. Yeah, I, I want to just for my knowledge, because everyone else may be aware, is lit a acronym or is it lit like literature? <laughs> Uh, well, we're hoping that the engaging and enlightening activities will get the kids excited okay. about learning. And so lit for us is literature camp based on. Literature camp. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We're going to focus on making sure the kids can read, write. Read. Yes, sir. All those things. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. One, one last question. Yes, sir. Uh, I know we've always kind of collaborated with uh, uh, the park and rec, mm -hmm. you know, with summer activities for our kids. It had a conversation been had with park and rec no sir I'll be honest we have not yet we've gone straight to the homes from the schoolhouse to the homes at this particular point as far as reaching those students but I will add at that partner um, well the, re the reason I mention it because I see the the dates and in, in, uh, just knowing what the park and rec is doing and the park and rec knowing what we're doing yes sir that that makes them a, a smooth transit transaction okay. uh, students going here or going there okay and they That's have that point. knowledge because I, i've seen that kind of go to the left in years of past so I, I i would just encourage you all to maybe talk with kelly or robbie okay. uh with the park and rec yes sir thank you thank you any other questions from members thank you so much miss austin for your update Next, we'll have <clears throat> an update from Dr. Tiffany Taylor, Executive Director of Teacher and Leader Effectiveness Division. All right, good afternoon, board. Good afternoon. Um, Chairman Brown. Hello. And so I'll try to be brief this afternoon as I bring you just a couple of updates from the Teacher and Leader Effectiveness Division. And so I'll mainly be focusing on um, accountability and how we'll communicate our goals around literacy and solving. And we know that solving um, does include um, both math and science. Um, this will ensure that our students are prepared to graduate college and career ready. And so when we look at the roadmap to success, I'll certainly key in on our vision for instruction, which has kind of been oversimplified to come to be known as reading, writing, speaking, and solving daily on grade level. 
And I'll just talk to you a little bit about the role of the Teacher and Leader Effectiveness Division, uh, which is to provide, of course, st strategic direction um, around our strategic um, goals and goal areas, but also to meet the requirements of the Georgia Department of Education, also federal um, guidelines that we have to meet. And then finally, other entities for accreditation, such as the Georgia Accreditation Council and Cognia. And so when I talk about the initiatives and the action steps that we're bringing forward, um, just keep that in mind that teacher and leader effectiveness is, is aiming to um, keep us situated well to implement all of the changes um, that come forward. And so here, I just wanted to kind of lay out for you, I won't read um, each of the lines here on the slide, but I did want to just come before you and talk to you about just the constant um, changes um, that the Department of Education um, goes through. So about every four or five years, we see that there is a review and adoption of new content area standards. And so I've gone back to 2005 just to highlight that in that year, we implemented the Georgia Performance Standards. And then between the years of 2010 and around 2013, we began to adopt and roll out the College and Career Georgia Performance Standards that came to be known the CCGPS Standards. And so when we implemented those standards at the Department of Education, here within the district, we also looked at adopting new language arts and science instructional materials. And then in um, 2013, we adopted um, some instructional materials. And really, that, that is just another word for textbooks at that time, so around the 2013 school year. And so then we went through another change. And so uh, around the 15-16 um, school year, we saw a new coding of standards where we moved from the CCGPS to the GSE, and that stands for the Georgia Standards of Excellence. And we had just adopted some material um, at that time. And then around in, in 21-22, you know, which is the most recent change that the State um, Department of Education has undergone, is the adoption of new math standards. And so we will be implementing that change next year and also preparing for um, an implementation of um, new language arts standards as well. And so we have kept up with those changes from the Department of Education um, by integrating those Georgia Department of Education units into our units here in Griffin Spalding. And then that is when around the 2018 school year um, our district went with the RCD, right? And we had policy IC that led that work and guided that work. Um, in uh, 2018, of course, uh, that was pre-pandemic, right? Um, you know, um, during the time that we were experiencing um, COVID. Harper, I've um, done something on the screen. If you can help me. Keep, keep going. I know you memorized it. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Around 2018, we adopted um, RCD, but that approach, we've really outgrown. Um, what we found is that it taxes our teachers in that they have to come in, they have to write curriculum. Uh, we do provide training for them. However, it's a constant, and we know also with the churn of teachers that a lot of times that knowledge leaves, uh, fortunately, um, with the teachers. And so what we did in 2022, um, you know, as I came in as an executive director, is we surveyed the teachers and we did a rollback of the RCD um, to move to a more realistic approach. We reduced some of the task. Um, that was one of the biggest changes with RCD. Um, teachers felt like they did not have enough time um, to implement the curriculum in the classroom. And so now that brings us to where we are. Uh, we feel like we have um, a, a really good foundation with the new teaching and learning frameworks, but it is time now for us to adopt some instructional materials. And Dr. Greer and her team, they're gonna come this afternoon and provide that um, recommendation to you for the materials that we wanna adopt that will then be integrated into the already scope and sequence um, that we have um, put for already. And so where are we now? I say where are we now, but it, I have to go back to 2018 and talk about 
Uh, I've been talking about tier one instruction. That is the instruction that all of our students receive. Um, and so in 2018, we decided that we were going to discontinue Read 180 and Math 180. Those were some programs that we had been using for some time and we thought we were stagnant with those. And now we are utilizing iReady. Um, our teachers are finding good success with iReady. They are implementing it, they are using it. Uh, we are seeing, in particular in language arts, with the full implementation of iReady, we are seeing where our students are beginning to, beginning to fill in some of those gaps. So you'll hear more about our plan to continue that. Um, Orton-Gillingham, we know that that is approach um, to teaching reading. Um, most recently, um, the legislature did um, pass uh, House Bill 238, and what that does is make us similar to some states um, such as Mississippi, South Carolina, who has made a strong stance on how we teach reading. And so no more will we teach balanced literacy, uh, what's called a balanced literacy approach. And now it is a part of state law that we will um, teach um, foundational reading, kindergarten through second grade, based on structured reading. And so that is the science of reading. So g the good news is, is that we have been implementing Orton-Gillingham for some years now, so we are ahead of the curve. That is a celebration point, so you can put your hands together. Um, because we have already been implementing um, um, Orton Gillingham, a structured reading approach. So that is the right work. Um, that bill also requires that we would provide professional learning for our teachers. And so when we came to you and asked for you to approve um, the implementation of letters, you may have heard um, Dr. Greer and us coming up talking about the letters professional learning, that is simply the science of reading. So again, Griffin Spalding, uh, we are in a great place um, for implementing um, the requirements of that, that, that house bill. And so um, as stated, as, just, as we continue, we'll continue to enhance the teaching and learning frameworks um, for tier one and then for tier two, um, we're utilizing iReady along with other just direct instruction um, strategies. And so I will begin to um, kind of close out my presentation here today. I want you to consider some statistics here. And these statistics are not um, relative to our students here in Griffin Spalding, but it is based on the new teacher project, um, which really talks about um, providing re uh, grade level reading, writing, speaking, and solving to our scholars daily. And so uh, when we look at some of their research, it states that students, if they're given assignments, whatever assignments we give them, typically they meet the demand of that assignment 71% of the time. So let's think about that. If it is on grade level, 71% of the time, or if it's off grade level, 71% of the time. Um, but studies show us that students often demonstrate mastery at about 17% um, of the time. We also see sometimes with low expectations that students who are not from higher economic backgrounds, sometimes they spend two times as much time um, off of grade level assignments as their peers who are from um, more higher income backgrounds, and then five times as much time with strong instruction. So again, what that highlights for you is uh, really just reiterating what our vision for instruction is. We have to provide our students opportunities and access to own grade level instruction if we want to begin to close those gaps that we know students have. And then that final bullet, when students who started the year behind grade level, and we know that we do have students who start behind, um, but when they had access to stronger instruction, they closed those gaps um, within about six months as a time as their, their peers who, who don't have those gaps. So I'll close in saying that um, you know, I, 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 I feel good about where we are as a teacher and leader effectiveness division. We still have work to do for our scholars, of course, but we will be really keying in in the coming year um, with the, the statement that is here. It is our desire that every student should have access to grade appropriate assignments, strong instruction, deep engagement with a teacher 
that has high expectations for them every day in every classroom. And so when um, Dr. Greer comes and provides for you our recommendation for instructional materials, I hope that you'll kind of make some connections with where we're trying to go, our vision for instruction, to support our teachers with professional learning opportunities and strong material in every class every day. Are there any questions? Ladies and of the board, we have heard the update from Dr. Taylor. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns at this moment? Leader Holmes? Good. You good? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. All right. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Next up, Money Bag Yo. Fiscal year 2024 tentative budget presentation, Mr. Byron Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, board members, again. Uh, before I start my presentation, I wanted to just make a few comments about the book we had talked about briefly in the public hearing. For those of you that have it, I just want to point you to tab two, first page in tab two. This typically is a summary document um, which correlates to other things that I'll speak of in, the net, in this meeting and the three subsequent meetings where we'll be together over the next month. But this is normally the format of what you'll see in the newspaper. So after the tentative budget is adopted, it'll either be this same document or it'll be tweaked and a recommended version for the next uh, meeting that we come together. But this will be what you see that's advertised by law, has to be put out there. And then again, we have, uh, after that runs in the newspaper for 14 days, we can still make changes, and we will, because of, we'll talk about in a minute some of the figures that we've not gotten yet before final budget adoption on May 16th. So before I go over the PowerPoint, is there any piece of the book that you would like to ask me about? Or do you need me to do any overview of anything about some tabs and what they're meaning yeah, is? So we're looking at page three, uh, Mr. Jones, or tab three, looking at the tentative budget uh, with the fund balance beginning of the year of 19 and then fund balance end of the year 18. What was, what was that money spent on? I'm sorry, where are you at again, sir? Uh, this will be the first page of tab three. Are you talking about the document I was just going over? Yes, sir. Okay. What's, all right, ask me the question again, please. All right. It's what now? I'm sorry, tab two. Sorry, okay. tab two. So uh, fund balance beginning of the year was $19 million. Fund balance in the year is 18.6. So just what was that? What was right. That? So, so reading that document left to right, that figure you're talking about is only about the capital projects fund, okay. which will then be splice receipts of $12,350,000 at the top. And then our spending would be higher than that, which we know that because we've got four active SPLOST accounts going on. Correct. So really, if you go over to the left general fund, mm -hmm. look down at the bottom, the key figure that you'll see in the PowerPoint, and this is similar to last year's presentation when I made to you initially, we would like to operate right now with about $3.5 million in fund balance usage. Uh, and that's what we'll talk about here in just a second. What are those costs that are making that be something that we don't think we can operate in our current revenue structure? Thank you. Okay. Do y'all, and, and again, if you want to keep looking through the book and bring back some more questions at the next meeting, that's fine. If you've got any more now, the book is a source document. It needs to be viewed as a working document. There will be future tweaks. You had asked about an organizational chart that is known to be going to be tweaked. We had to give you a version now. We acknowledge that that is going to be tweaked, but we want, did not want to leave it out of here so you knew what we were operating in. Could I, could I make a suggestion to uh, Mr. Jones? Yes, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Jones, uh, on, on uh, tab five where, where we're just, you know, you're going over really the staffing uh, projections for each school. And uh, I, I would personally like to see if you haven't included it in here, I, I didn't find it, but uh, where, where the changes in the schools were in negative, I'd like to see what positions were uh, lost at, at the uh, various schools, especially the elementary level, because I only see two elementary schools with no changes and uh, 
and only uh, I think it's just maybe one that that may have added a staff. The rest is uh, they they've lost. I, I would like to get a a breakdown of what positions these these uh, elementary school because uh, they they seem to be the one that was the hardest hit. Right, and I can I can explain that for you. For the last couple of years, we've left the schools whole. Uh, if you remember, a couple of years ago, maybe my first budget presentation, we knew there was going to be a loss of trending FTS loss during the COVID cycle. Uh, the board uh, tasked the superintendent with us to leave schools whole, which we did. We knew that was going to be in um, a usage of our fund balance or cash. So that is prior budget year. The year that we are looking at now, which is the FY23 year, right. there was a change to our, our funding model and our, our state law changed last summer for EIP and the way that's funded. And we left the schools whole on the EIP as well, elementary only for EIP for this year. So that's a change of, let's just say I'm using the numbers in the book, 13 positions. Yep. Going into FY24, we cannot afford to leave them whole again. And so that's why that, that's playing out the way it is. Their, their loss of FTE plus truing up uh, how we fund EIP, for example, they can't have, but I think it's 12 to 14 in a class where we used to be using 18 in a class. And when we brought that number back into fruition, it caused some of these some of these reductions. And some of the schools are allowed to keep funding that through the ESSER monies for one more year. But this is, this is the preliminary analysis that they receive, but it's strictly related to the early intervening program for elementary. And those are the only ones that earn that money. It's not the Midland High School. Board mates, I, 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 I you know, doing this process, and this, this is where we need to ask these questions and, and dialogue with the superintendent and uh, the CFO. But when you see some of our, some of our, I, I don't want to use struggling for the lack of a better term, but when you see some of our schools that have, traditionally not perform well and uh, you see them losing so many uh, positions I, I think we need to take a hard look at, at those schools and those losses at least have a discussion we may not be able to come up with a uh, solution but right. we, we need to we need to have some hard conversations let me let me say this to you as well Th this is I may need to relabel this document because this is just our generally funded state earned type positions and and five four or five barber I get school improvement money so they're they're able to add additional positions and this is on this is in addition to the ESSER money which we're giving them an additional EIP position a bridge teacher their fund 150 which is their federal money title one two three uh, and four all that's pooled together in our budget meetings. I know you had, had come to a couple of meetings. I think Griffin and I was one of them there asking for additional positions. So this isn't a catch-all document. This is just the ones that are funded through what they quote earned through the state funding formula. There's other positions that they're being granted. And in the presentation, there's a, an item on focus schools. There's five schools that the superintendent is designating as a focus school, which some of these you're probably talking about are on that list. I have a list of them. I just need to make sure if you want me to name them, I think they would be a part of this. So uh, he can, uh, the superintendent can share that with you, that information with you. Okay, we, we, we have a discussion offline about that. Okay. Right. Thank you, sir. Non-negotiables, I'm trying to communicate effectively. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> mission and vision, we're going we're gonna to ultimately empower each student to graduate college and career ready. A lot of this stuff I've talked to you in the prior meeting, but we're aligning our resources bottom left for the school district and our roadmap to success second year. Goal areas, I shared this with you uh, earlier. I will uh, spare you another analysis of the goal area. Again, we'll talk about on that in just a second on some other documents. These are our total funding sources right now. This is based on the most available information available at the time. Uh, I have a little bullet point at the bottom that talks about general fund and special revenue. General fund, again, is subject to change. Uh, we have not received our official uh, QBE revenue estimates yet. I do think they will be a little less than what I was planning on, but again, I've got to wait for that to come in. And then our special revenue amounts, 
uh, those could change a little bit based on some grant uh, that we would be awarded between now and the final budget approval. Capital projects, school nutrition, and debt service should not be changing. Our FTE counts, I mentioned this in a public hearing, the bottom left number, this will be the first year that we've had an increase in FTE. Uh, that's again based 9,153 students and that's based on an average of two October counts and one March count. So uh, this would not give a big weight to any students that we may have lost through the tornado because that was in January and we have a March count. So we have two counts prior to that one that is making up this FTE count. Uh, so again, that will, that's good news for this year that we at least stabilized on our FTE and did not drop. It's $5,000 a child whenever we lose, lose the children. For some of our uh, general fund expenditures, we've got some uh, things we'll just point your attention to. The school day will decrease by one day for the students for next year. It will include uh, the teachers working 190, so that's just be an extra day of, of professional learning there. Uh, step increases for all the eligible employees and the certified salary increase, which we talked about earlier, are in uh, the budget as of right now. Uh, when I say local teaching supplement in the middle, that's just to point out that any time that the certified salary scale increases because it, the local supplement is based on a percentage, that increases automatically. Um, health insurance, we've talked a lot about that. It will cost almost $19,000 a year for us to insure uh, someone if they choose our health insurance. That is for certified employees. Uh, that's effective actually right now. Uh, the classified employees will begin to be phased in January 1 of 2024. That'll be over a two year time frame. TRS is not changing for next year. Uh, last year you all approved a longevity supplement that we are continuing to look at and uh, plan to leave in the budget for next year annually approved for people who are topped out on the certified salary schedule. Uh, and then just as a reminder, approximately six and a half million dollars will have to be returned to the general fund from ESSER 3, or excuse me, ESSER 2. Uh, and those, are, those approximations are in the budget as well. Mr. Holmes, to your point, this top bullet on the next slide talks to a total of around 14 positions at an average of 60,000 a position. I'm probably a little low on that money, but it's just an average so by savings of $840,000. The offset of that is we are seeing an increased amount of identified children for special education, and I'll show you in just a second. Mr. Kelly has requested additional positions for those students to meet those IEP expectations. Uh, so that'll balance out. That won't be a, just a direct saving. Some of that'll be a, a, basically a swap for a, a different type of a position. Uh, I mentioned to you about COVID-19 and the six and a half million already. Pre-K uh, usually costs us around $170,000 to fund the pre-K program in it, and that's, in a, that's the general fund money that we move to the pre-K program. The main reason for that is this district has traditionally paid teachers on the uh, regular teaching K through 12 schedule. Not all districts do that. Uh, this district has, and that caused some of that offset. Transfer to workers' comp, this came up in Ms. Battle's presentation. Uh, we typically transfer owner about $300,000 uh, from the general fund. Uh, if we wind up approving that tonight, that could change that number downward. So for now, it's not approved, so the, the budget is reflecting that. Uh, so here's, here's uh, the main point right now. We're looking at trying to operate in a deficit mode of $3.5 million for the general fund. Uh, it could grow higher than that. I'm just simply going to have to wait until I get the, get the revenue figures from the state. At that point, the superintendent will uh, give me a directive to try to balance the budget within a certain amount higher or lower than that. So in the next couple of meetings, we'll give you more information on that. Uh, you're used to seeing this uh, document. Uh, I think we revised this document, but this is not the one that's showing on the screen. I think we had uh, put an amended document. Today. Didn't we trim that down? So board members, real quick, the line, just stand, stand by okay. yourself. Ultimately, when we get down to uh, seeking tentative and, and final approval and adoption of the budget, we'll share with you uh, what our good, better, and best options are. But for now, uh, just look at the request as the first iteration. Moving forward, should those requests, should additional requests come in, then we'll give you a positive or a delta uh, to show what that growth or what that subtraction may look like. But Worrying about what's good, better, and best is, is, is a moot point at the moment because as you can see, the numbers aren't changing. 
those numbers as we begin to prioritize what requests are as we begin to get more numbers with regards to costs coming from uh, the governor's office and such we'll be able to give you a better understanding and, and uh, additional if iterations of what the budget numbers will look like so um, having said that that's what Byron was talking about we tried to trim that down for you so that you <coughs> have to see as much <coughs> that really didn't tell you as much but we weren't able to get that taken care of okay thank you superintendent let me just run through these right quick Retention supplement, you all have already approved that. That's going to be for our returning employees to Griffin Spalding next year. Uh, I'm, again, I mentioned this in the hearing. I'm happy that that applies to the classified and the certified. It will be a phased-in approach based on if people do leave the district, they would not get the full amount of that money. So it's tied to true retention. Thank you, Ms. Battle, for bringing that approach for us. Uh, and it will be paid out over three increments, FY24. It is all American Rescue Plan money. It's not the general fund, ARP means care uh, S or three uh, the two thousand dollar governor recommendation we've got listed here uh, I could be a little high on that number I just simply took two thousand uh, dollars times a thousand employees and marked it up for Social Security and Medicare uh, annual step increase I talked about that earlier eight hundred thousand dollars one item we are looking at is trying to uh, add some steps to the administrative salary scale that is uh, one to 14 steps here that, that's typically lower than most districts but that's that's the way that it has been here in Griffin Spalding we did add steps to classified employees last year uh, in that salary study taking them up past 20 to 25 I believe it is and then our uh, teaching scale offers more steps than the, the state certified scale as well so we wanted to take a look at that extracurricular supplements we had a request so we uh, do have that in here I believe the original dollar amount was 40,000 that we were asked to look at but we put 80,000 in here to look at and see if we can look at middle and high we still got to look at that as a whole uh, but we do have that uh, put in here to recognize that it was a request state health benefit I talked to you about that already that could approach six six million dollars or so uh, for the system we don't really have any choice into that we don't have a way to opt out of that so that it is what it is at this point um, Ms. Battle and I received a request. Actually, it came out of uh, some of the budget hearings from the schools, they, uh, budget meetings. They asked us to look at moving uh, paraprofessionals, the ability to hire them at eight hours versus seven. We do already do that for pre-K, but we had that request. Not that it will be required, but could, could we offer that more for parapros and bump hour? But there is a cost to that, so we're recognizing it here on this document. Um, I mentioned earlier that there will be a focus group of schools for the UVA Virginia partnership and we had this item on here last year so this is the amount of money in addition to the new money on top of what we were paying last year for support for some of our schools uh, uh, the board has previously approved a weapons detection system the total cost is higher than this but this is the amount of the maintenance for one year for Griffin and Spalding High which is four weapons machines total so we have that budgeted uh, Mr. Kelly has presented to senior cabinet uh, a plan for special education and the original quest request was for 10 teachers and 10 paraprofessionals that has not been all approved by the superintendent at this point I believe at this point we're looking at five and five at this point it's not that we won't bring the full 10 in but I wanted to recognize what the request was at this point and again that's part of that offset that I said earlier when we had lost some uh, regular uh, allotments in that 14 that we had on the other sheet the superintendent had has a um, request for to add a position potentially called administrative deans at the elementary schools for support so that has a cost that will be 11 positions uh, we have that in here as at this point to continue to look at we have also noticed that our ESOL population is doubled possibly even tripled here recently Dr. Taylor and I and Ms. Battle met the other day to look at that and we do think we need two more teachers for ESL, ESOL students and then we have a request for two additional resource officers those will be located at Griffin and Spalding High Schools for a total of four at those two schools. Uh, if you look all the way to the bottom, it does approach 17 million. Some of this, again, is, is uh, ESSER 3 money. Some of it is reimbursed from the state for salaries, and health insurance, et cetera. So it's not a direct hit on the bottom line for the general fund, but we did want to put that on here for you to see the amount of money. The bullet point, good, better, best, will follow. We tweaked this, but the version we've got here doesn't have that tweak to it. And then we reserve the right to make changes, additions, and deletions to this. So you may see something next time new, a new position. You may see something removed. We don't feel like we want to recommend it ultimately to the board. 
So let me stop here. Is there any questions about, there's only two blue sheets right now. Is there any questions that I can answer from you? Yes, sir. I, 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 Mr. Brown, is it okay if I ask a question? Okay. I want to point out, maybe it's a mistake, yeah, I don't know, but under your, your annual step increase, uh, it doesn't match up with either good, better, best, the amount. Is it like 300000 above either? Is that on purpose or that, that was a mistake? Now I'm looking at I'm looking at the one up here on the screen. The one in your packet may be different. We yeah, the one, the one, that. the one in the packet. On yeah, the I think good. we caught, we caught that. Yeah. We fixed it up here. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm good. We're good with. It. Any other questions on the blue sheets right now? So our, our other remaining funds, special revenue, again, are our grants that are listed here. I won't go through all of them. Just the main one is our ESSER 3, one more year of that, approximately $10.5 million. That's just an estimated figure that we'll carry into FY24. We talked about pre-K salaries already. Nutrition fund, again, with a community eligibility provision. If you look at that summary page that I told you would be running the newspaper, he will show a deficit. That's by design because... Uh, Robert has to carry so many months of, he can't have but so many months of excess cash, so that is planned to buy equipment. That's not just cost overruns for salaries and benefits at this point. He's, he's got a plan that he's wanting to replace steamers, et cetera, so that would be why you would see that. Debt service, again, is, is still at zero. Capital projects, Mr. Ballard and I talked about this, and the, the project, some of this was the same as last year, but some of the East Plus 6 would be different. So we still have, have projects listed that we are either started on already and will continue or new projects in FY24. We are estimating the receipts more at a million dollar range instead of the original because we have been over collecting on that versus the original estimate. So in summary, again, we'll continue to, uh, we'll, we'll continue to analyze all the budgets. We've talked about the salary scale items, the instructional calendar, the teacher allotments, uh, the ESSER usage of funds. Again, just remember when we're trying to balance the budget, all of the salaries that we're bringing back in, that's one of the reasons our fund balance has grown to the, the level it has over the last couple of years. That was by design. So we may have to use some of that. Timetable for adoption, again, we'll be together again April 25th. That'll be a busy day for you all well, with your retreat. But we will come back and have another public hearing at 4. We will then ask, have a called Board of Education meeting for you to ask you to approve the 24 budget tentatively. We'll then run it in the newspaper come back on May 2nd, uh, have another work session presentation, and then our final public hearing on the budget will be before uh, the board meeting on the 16th, and then we'll ask you to adopt the final budget on uh, May the 16th. So you got at least three more opportunities to communicate with us or, or ask us to change or relook at or, or answer questions. At this point, is there anything else that I can answer for you all? The last one. Go ahead, sir. So I had you to chair the budget meeting earlier today. Mr. Jones, uh, my concern and the board mates is money that we use, uh, the ESSA fund, uh, money that we use for staffing, uh, things of that nature is, is my concern is that we, just like with a, with a grant, you know, they give you money. Are you going to be able to sustain that? Or is it going to just have to go away? What 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 is the projections? Because I'm still on that on, on I'm still on the staff that 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 13 position that we're mm -hmm. um, losing mainly at the elementary level. And um, we've asked the schools back on that particular question. We've had several schools ask us could they change their. Uh, EIP model, I don't, Dr. Greer's in the room. I did not meet with you, but I met with Ms. Phillips. Uh, uh, Dr. Taylor's office has already requested to meet with me to under, better understand the funding model for EIP. I think there's five models that the schools can be using to see if they can earn additional money through that. And so that's already going on now okay. for next year for planning. But don't, don't make any mistake, come in here next year. I mean, we, we already know that we may have to look at how we fund schools for basic necessities, I mean, we know that. I mean, I know that. I mean, it's, it, you can't have but a certain amount of kids in the school and it may hit the general fund at some point. I think Ms. Austin encourages all the schools at this point to, if, if we're hiring folks on the ESSER payroll, 
right off the bat, we're trying to do that with non understanding it's non-recurring. I think that communication is already happening with the employee and the supervisor. Also, they attempt to hire retirees for non-benefit eligible uh, employees like that, so we don't have that issue come up ongoing. So I know is that is that correct? Is that communication? So I know there's an intent to do that. And, and that that was a, a point that I was going to bring out as well as you know through attrition could some of these positions instead of uh, these people that have been hired uh, having to be you know let go yeah. or whatever but you, you know that, that's a that's a big concern of mine uh, because uh, you know there's a there's a phrase that that's used in a lot of industries which is not not a real good phrase to use in my opinion i used to use it but doing more with less it, it's got no and and uh you know you you wh when you are not adequately staffed that 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 that's a real that's a real uh life situation that you have to deal with with employee morale uh and, and we're gonna have to consider that um I, i'm just real stuck on that because uh you know you go to these schools, I, I tell teachers all the time, people at the building level, I wouldn't do their jobs. I, I just wouldn't do it. You know, sitting up here and doing what we do, it's, it's, it's relatively uh, different and a lot easier in my opinion, but at the school level, in the classroom level, and you don't have adequate staffing, that, that's, that, that's a hard road to uh, the hole right there. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm real concerned that we have positions that we are especially at the elementary school any level but especially at the elementary uh, school level because if we don't get these babies and keep them from the third grade on you know we, it, it, you you've seen the studies we're going to lose them that, that's where they're going to fall by the wayside so so i think we're going to have to really make some tough decisions have some hard conversations and look at what we can do uh, to offset having to say or tell a principal that they're going to lose a position. Uh, that, 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 that's not going to be uh, a real good conversation or situation that they should have to be in. Like I said, some, some of that, uh, I don't want to say it's imbalance, but some of that reduction right now, the schools are seeing that now because we have left them whole for a couple of years on certain items. We are able to um, continue some of those services by shifting them to ESSER for one more year. Not exactly all of the 14, but some of them they're able to fund. If they were a minus one, they are being allowed to fund that through their Fund 150 or their ESSER funds. That again is just the general fund. But let me speak to your original question. Yes, if, if we have staff paid through ESSER in our normal attrition, uh, Ms. Battle could speak to that in terms of what our normal retirements or people that we lose for whatever reason, there's gonna be at least a minimum number. And you know, if those uh, employees were interviewed or whatever the transfer protocol was, I'm sure they would be eligible to be hired on with a different funding source. Uh, okay. Mr. Brown. Ms. McDonough, you recognize. Thank you. I think what we're on, on the same line of Mr. Holmes, I think what we're asking these schools to do that are losing, you know, four and three bodies per school is, is a lot to me. <clears throat> we're asking you to do this and be really good at it, and now we're going to take some of the troops away, and we're still, the expectations are still going to be here, but you have less people. I, I don't, I'm not really sure I understand that either because these are schools that are high need schools um, and that's not a criticism it's I, I don't know I have a real hard time taking people away from especially high need populations and we've asked them to do this we gave it to them last year we didn't make any changes and now we're we're taking that artillery away and I, I don't know I, I, I'm like Mr. Holmes I have some reservations about it that's all I got thanks yes ma'am thank you sir so uh, Mr. Holmes Mr. McDonald thank you both for um, sharing the concern I think briefly um, to answer the question we, we will take a look uh, but more importantly we will try and create 
uh, an opportunity to have some deep discussion around strategic planning. I I'll just be, um, I I'll ask that you be reminded, funding stems from FTE, the number of students enrolled in schools. Uh, the difficult discussion isn't about whether or not schools are losing teachers. The difficult discussion is about at what point is a school too small to operate. Um, and, and so rather than getting into all of that in the moment, uh, I'll acknowledge that it is, that it is difficult. Um, I'm reminded of a, of a quote from Mother Teresa. Uh, you, you may or may not know it, but it starts with we the willing, led by the unknowing. Um, and, and so I, I've, I learned that a long time ago, and, and, and it, it is something that we want to be you know, mindful of. But at the end of the day, I, I recall the board and I having a conversation about why I had reservations about even leaving schools whole two years ago. Because the enrollment trend is that schools are going to continue to lose students. And the question is, if you're losing students, what are you doing with the adults? And we're going to have to figure out how to populate the school and staff the school as well. But rather than trying to come up with a solution that is, is multiple decades old uh, in terms of the problem, I'll, I'll acknowledge it is problematic. It is concerning. Uh, the purpose of, of the budget is to help you understand and then you to, to give some guidance. If, if you're one in which you say give the schools what they're asking for, we can do that. But I'll come back to you and say you now need to talk about, you know, furloughs and cutting positions. And uh, so, so again, you, the, 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 the burden of a systems approach is some, someone has to give while someone is pulling. Uh, someone's going to get while someone is losing. That's how it works. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll present to you as many options as we can, but the, what you get to do as the governance team is set the direction for this district by approving the budget that supports your vision for the district. And so I, I look forward to the conversation, but I, I did not want to miss the opportunity to share with you in public again. This is a difficult conversation, but it's not the most difficult one at hand. We've got, we've got to figure out how to manage, uh, you know, declining enrollment. Uh, we've got to figure out how to manage, you know, increasing and in, in more diverse needs of the students that we're serving. Um, and I look forward to doing that with you, so. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Simmons, for those comments, but let me, let me plant this seed uh, to board mates superintendent, CFO, principals. I, I've been in a situation like this, uh, furloughs, uh, having to lay off staff. But what, I, but what I've, I saw and what I see for us now is uh, opportunity. And that opportunity is we, we, we've got to do some out-of-the-box thinking. Whether, whether you, look at, you look at scheduling or planning instead of losing an employee, uh, uh, you know, use them in a different time slot than they, they normally. You, you, you look at their overall performance throughout the day. You look at where they may be downtime or where they're the most productive or where they're the most needed. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm asking this board and, and asking uh, all of us on the governance team, let's, let's not do the traditional things that we've always done or what's always has been done. Let, let's do some out of the box thinking because I've seen it done. I've been a part of a, uh, a leadership team that, that had to make some tough decisions and I don't want, you, you know, we can't give everybody what they want, but we can make sure we, we have uh, at our schools what's needed. You know, I'm not, I'm not into giving people what they want, but uh, I, I do think we have the fiduciary responsibility to give our schools what they need to educate our babies. 
So I'm just planting the seed that let's not do it like we always have done it. Let, let, let's think outside the box. We, we have, we, we've done some of that, uh, you know, over the, over the years. We've had to do it. So, so let, let, let's put these great minds together and let us come up with a plan on how we can best utilize staffing. may not be in the traditional manner. Some women may, may have to come in a little later uh, in the day and, and work to the end of school. May come in early and leave at lunchtime. Just created stuff that could be done with staffing. But, but I think we need to take on this challenge and, and not just um, handle it or look at it in the old traditional way that we always or school system always do. Let, let's think outside the box. I, I know we can do it. So, thank you. Thank you so much. The gentleman has much passion for which he speaks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Board members, we have some board appointments. Uh, normally, they are probably not brought before the board, and there are a lot of appointments that, in full transparency, I just wanted to make known of what is happening um, with our governance team and the committees and appointments that we are doing. Next slide, Lonnie. Appreciate you. All right, keep going. Keep going, keep going. Appreciate you, all right. Archway, Archway Partnership, we heard an update from our Archway professional uh, today. And so at this point, uh, Archway Partnership will, the appointment will go for Mr. Doss um, as a representative of the Board of Education. And of course, Dr. Keith Simmons as a superintendent. And I will serve as an ex officio on that committee with Archway Partnership. Are there any questions about Archway and the structure and what they're doing? None. All right. Next one. Agnes B. Hunt Trust Fund. Uh, Mr. Hunt is uh, from Griffin, Georgia, and this trust fund was set up to ensure that students in Spalding County uh, were able to further their education and that um, without regard to race, color, or creed, and such educational travel organizations must operate in Griffin, Spalding County, Georgia. And so the appointment for the Agnes B. Hunt Trust Fund is leader Zachary B. Holmes of the third. He has been on that committee since 2020. Not much activity has happened during COVID. However, we are back and we're ready to award some scholarships from the trust fund um, and Mr. Hunt's family to students in Spalding County. Are there any questions about the Agnes? Yes, sir. So what is the tradition as to who sits on that Board. I know that the DFACS has traditionally chaired that. What is? Yeah, so right now, because it's been in activity, right now there is myself, Mr. Holmes, a judge of the Superior Court, and then the DFACS uh, director. Uh, Phyllis Easton Barkley has since retired, so we are still in the process of trying to, with the people who run the trust, to reach out to DFACS and figure out who that appointment will be. But as it relates to the Board of Education, <coughs> That's the appointment. May I expound on that, Mr. Yes, Chair? No, normally, Mr. Doss is, is the director um, of DFACS, sits on that board, uh, sits on that committee, that trust fund committee. But right now, as a lot of you know, DFACS does not have an office. They, they are still displaced, working from home and various things of that sort. So. They are not even geared up uh, to have anyone, I guess, to, to, to serve, because I think uh, the director is, uh, they're working from home mostly. Only people that are in the office is the, the regional finance people out off of Aerodrome or whatever that is. But that's how, that's how that normally operates. So that's why it's still enacted. They just, they don't, they don't have a home, they don't have a place. Thank you so much, Leader Holmes, for answering that question. 
Any other questions for the Agnes B. Hunt Trust Fund? None. Next one, Lenny. Exemplar Committee. Uh, this is a chair that I've, a committee that I've chaired for the last four years. Uh, we've been exemplar uh, status, and we are going to continue uh, that trajectory. Uh, this year, I am appointing Ms. McDonald V to chair that committee. Her vice chair will be Lear Holmes. We have added a teacher, Ms. Meeknon Schultz, who is now at Oars, but going to Program Challenge. We have, uh, as I call him, the math guy, Dr. Thompson, who will represent central office. We have our director of communications, Adam Pugh. Our community uh, folks will be Robbie Milner, a uh, local pastor and from Spalding County, uh, Parks and Recreation. We also have Ms. Brittany Standifer, who will stay on as the, not Archway professional, but a person who is in Archway to the committee. And uh, Mr. Doss appointed Ms. Cheryl King as the parent representative. And my good brother, Adam Pugh, we're gonna find a scholar representative to sit on that committee. Are there any questions? Grade uh, are you striving for in terms of grade level for that? For the Last scholar? year we had a third grader on the committee. Oh, understood. Thank you. And that third grader provided much feedback <laughs> as to what was wrong, what wasn't wrong, <laughs> and what needs to be better. And, and so we love the fact that our scholars are providing us direction as I call them our bosses. All right. And last but not least, our norms and protocols committee. Uh, chairing that will be Mr. Doss at the second and uh, on that committee. Surprise, surprise, Ms. Cook, you're on the norms and protocols committee. <laughs> um, we actually passed a board code of ethics and so that code of ethics is tied to the norms and protocols. Uh, the board has come a mighty long way from the times of uh, not caring about norms and protocols, but we know that these are the best practices in order for our governance team to be the very best that we can be and what we have exhibited that we are. So we are excited that Mr. Doss and Ms. Cook will work on norms and protocols. And that is it. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you, good people. All right, information item. All right, information items as you see printed in the agenda, monthly facilities maintenance report, February, construction renovation progress, summary number 286. Are there any board member comments at this time? All right, hearing none, there is no executive session at this time. Uh, what is the pleasure of this body as it relates to adjournment? It has been properly motioned to adjourn by Ms. McDonald the fifth, seconded by Leader Holmes of the third. All those in favor, please.